That was amazing. That was Brad standing up. That was Brad standing up? <laughs> so just so everybody knows, Brad Koslick here um, organized much of this, um, really put it all together, really in the last, what do you think, three weeks? So I want to thank Brad publicly for um, for getting Jim Groom here. Okay, so this is really awesome. So it is my, uh, my my distinct pleasure to introduce to you guys today, um, Mr. Jim Groom from the University of Mary Washington. I've known Jim for probably what do you think five or six years now, um, and he has picked up the mantle of innovation in higher education and ed tech in a way that I don't think anybody has really seen. That's in short bursts. I mean, everybody thinks Jim is known for UMW blogs, which is amazing. But the things that Jim thinks about are really much more than that. He really thinks about teaching, he really thinks about pedagogy, he thinks about practice. And it's in those thoughts that have really transformed the way people do things with technology in their classrooms. Um, Jim is known internationally. He, um, for better or for worse, he's coined the term edupunk. He's been in Fast Company. He's one of, the, one of the brightest guys I know on the web. And he's actually relatively bright in person, too, which is, has been surprising to, to learn about you, Jim. Um, Jim's going to talk about a whole range of things today. I don't know how you want to do this, Jim. You can let us know if you want questions during or after or how we want to do it. Um, the microphones in the front of the room are here because we actually have probably about 25,000 additional people out there on the Internet watching this right now. Um, and they're watching via media site. They're listening in over DS106 radio, which you're going to get to learn about here in a couple minutes. And Brad is actually going to live stream it from an iPod Touch to DLT, DTLT TV live at the uh, University of Mary Washington as well. So um, with that, please join me in welcoming Jim Grimm. I break down. Um, what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about a wide range of stuff um, that we've experimented with at the University of Mary Washington. And it's going to start kind of orderly. And you know, you're going to get a sense of what I'm talking about. But then it's going to probably devolve into chaos. And I just want to apologize for that. So it starts orderly, <laughs> kind of like our plans and hopes for any year, and then slowly devolves into chaos. So <laughs> just so you know. Um, it, I don't know where it's ultimately going. So, domain of one's own. This is a reference. The title is something I'll explain in more detail, but this is obviously a reference to Virginia Woolf's idea of a room of one's own. And the question for me, and this has been the question for me for probably the last five years and has driven most of the work I've done on the web with ed tech, is what does it mean to give faculty, staff, and students their own space online to experiment, to create, to share and to build. And it's to that end that pretty much everything I've done over the last five years has kind of built toward. And I can't say it's been a resounding success. It's had moments. But it is still very, me, very, very much for me the point of interest I have with the web, teaching and learning, and what it means for us to be here in this moment, which is a fascinating moment. And much of it starts with this, right, email. What does it mean that most of us when we started university, I remember I was in university in 1993, 94, when UCLA was first coming online. I got my first email address, jgroom at ucla.edu. And that is an archive that I've lost 20 years later. It's completely gone. I left the university. I lost all my relationships to that email. I couldn't get on it kind of up six months after I left and graduated. And there's an interesting thing to me about email. Email is an important identifier for us while we're here, that net ID and that idea of the kind of address. But as soon as we leave, that connection between us and the university is kind of strangely severed, right? And I'm thinking to myself, and this brings me back to this idea of the domain, why do we as universities with this kind of infrastructure of, ID, of IT kind of separate ourselves out from who we are? This is my address for UMW right now, but I rarely use it. Mostly I use jimgroom at gmail.com. That's kind of my main identity via email. How many of you remember something like this, right? The shared folder nightmare that we're just kind of emerging from? <laughs> you know, Google Docs came up with this notion of just sharing folders easily or files easily. And this whole idea of mapping drives 
and maybe doing something like web dev. I mean, what a nightmare. It was so much work. And like this was the infrastructure that we were working from. And this one is particularly special to me, the personal website. <laughs> Isn't this awesome? This is an aesthetic of a particular time and place, and many of us still have it. But notice, I don't know if you can see it in this one. And this is Marvin L. Denny's site. I'm sorry, Marvin. He doesn't know I took a screenshot of his site. I, this is not personal. But it's interesting to me, like, many of these professor sites, for some weird reason, always have someone climbing a mountain. <laughs> is that like a common theme in professors' <laughs> personal web pages? Like, you're all climbing mountains? Like, this is the mountain of bureaucracy. I don't know what it means, but they're always there. It's bizarre to me. I don't know, maybe it was a stock HTML theme issue. I don't know. But like these were sites you created on your own personal web space. It might be pfu.edu tilde jgroom. And that was your space, and you put your little HTML in there, and then you didn't update it for 15 years. And then it looked like this in 2012. And you were like, what? But all this while, something has changed, right? We've kind of been introduced in the websites, and that's kind of what the address is like. Can you guys relate to this address? Did you put this on your business card, right? This was something where, this is where you lived. But often because of the nature of the web, from about 95 through about 2001, it was very hard to update. It was very hard to change. You could say, oh, you know, um, Dreamweaver changed my life, but not really, because it didn't leave you to regularly update your stuff, right? Now, then, <laughs> Bum, ba -dum, bum. We had this. So email, web server, right? personal pages, and then lo and behold, the LMS, the black box of education. Most of my life is kind of, well, most of my life, no. Most of the last five years, which feels like my life, because I had kids seven years ago, so there's like a point where everything changes. So five years is pretty much all of my life. Because I don't remember any of my life before having kids. It just completely went away. I wish I could get it back. Like, I watch home movies to remember who I was. Um, so LMS, right? This idea for the last five or six years, this idea that we were storing our personal information and our class information in this black box. And what always talked to me about the LMS, I know there's functional features of it, testing, grade book, although I, I would argue that's not teaching and learning as we know it. But the thing that always told me the LMS doesn't love students is that at the end of a semester, when you've done this work there, what does it do? Deleted. Like, I don't love you, you're deleted. <laughs> Nothing you did in this class matters, deleted. You are deleted. And you think about this, there's an archive there of students' work over the course of their career that's invaluable to them. That I wish I had when I was going to school. That they can have, if we start thinking about the nature of publishing online in different ways. We start imagining the fact that each of us can manage and maintain our data and control where it goes and how it goes there and take it with us when we're done. And this notion of the domain of one's own is really that. It's this notion of an address that we take with us when we come to the university, we develop across while we're here, but we take it with us when we go. It's a seamless process. Now, I'm not much of an investigative reporter, I have to be honest, right? But I'm interested, is there even a personalized namespace in the LMS? Of course not. I'm interested right now in this notion of what's on the horizon, right? Here, and I know PSU went through this and decided ultimately against Google, um, Google Mail. And I actually think that's a good thing. And I might be one of the few people here. Why do I think that's a good thing that you're not using Google Mail or you're using Hotmail or Live as they call it? Well, one of the reasons that I'm interested in this or not using this is who are we as universities to bring 90,000 students like you do here at Penn State and say, look, you're locked into a contract with Google. And more than that, you're now part of their advertising empire. That's a weird position to us find ourselves in, right? Kind of forcing students into a model, right? And the latest EduCause journal, I don't know if you follow it, is like, DIY, too expensive. Outsource everything. So I'm a little bit afraid of the outsource everything. How did that work for the American economy? <laughs> um, well, you guys can judge that. There might be economists here who could say, actually, you're wrong. So feel free. The other one, live.edu. And then this one. In 2008, and I spoke about this earlier today to a bunch of folks, 
there was a Chronicle article that really fascinated me. The Chronicle article basically said this. Why the hell are we making students get a psu.edu email address or a umw.edu email address from the beginning? Why don't we just say, what's your email address? Oh, it's jimgroom at gmail.com, or it's jimgroom at hotmail.com, or it's da 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 Fine. Give it to us, and everything we want to communicate with you, we'll push out to you directly. Right? It seems like pretty easy in this day and age that we could do that. And so Boston College, under Mary C. Cochran, was like, you know what? That's what we're going to do. And I was like, oh my god, this is a model that we can start thinking about how we deliver all sorts of information and how we start thinking about publishing in new ways. So last year, I'm not much of, an, much of an investigative journalist, but I tried my hand at it. I called Mary Cochran. And I said, Mary, did you guys ever do this? And she said, I got to run. Talk to you later. She hung up on me. And I called her again. I said, Mary, what's going on with this? Did you ever kind of get this kind of free-flowing email where everyone brings their own kind of like bring your own email? She's like, I'm in a, oh, I'm in a meeting. Got to run. Then I felt like I was on to something. Like there was some like big black hole of information that wasn't being loose, and I thought I was going to get into like the nitty gritty. Ultimately, I found they never did it. I don't know why, and Mary didn't respond to me, and I kind of left it alone because I didn't want to be a stalker, like, Mary, <laughs> what's going on with your email? You know, I kind of have to <laughs> basically step back. But what I'm fascinated by is that their vision was this. We don't know the long-term implications of contracts with Gmail or contracts with Hotmail or Microsoft. We don't know what that means to put our students in ultimately a consumer relationship to a used advertising company. And so they're going to back out of it. Now, they ultimately didn't, and I'm interested in why they didn't, although I don't have an answer to that yet, because I don't think it's a bad model. Now, <laughs> this is where they talk about it. College officials looked into outsourcing their email to Google or to Microsoft, as many other colleges and universities have. Both companies offer services for free, and then Contract's incredibly difficult, though that might not be true. But for me, the real question is, what does it mean for us as universities, as public universities, to put our students in a relationship automatically mediated by an advertising company? Because <laughs> that's what Google is. It's an advertising company. And what does it mean when we put that much information into an advertising company's hands? What's more, how come faculty don't have to do it or can't do it, but students can like there's this kind of weird questions that I think universities in general around the country are kind of ignoring. Or at least saying, look, it's going to be cheaper. We're going to save money. Let's do it that way. I'm not convinced. You know, it may be a solution, but I don't know if one that we've kind of figured out. Now, this brings me to a different kind of modeling. And one of the reasons I'm probably here is this one. This is called UMW blogs. And it's not too different from something you have here called PSU blogs, right? You have Penn State blogs. It's been extremely successful. It was really cool because when I was developing this at Mary Washington, uh, Brad and Cole were developing PSU blogs alongside of it. So we were running parallel on di two different um, platforms, but really doing the same thing. And the bottom line behind this publishing platform, in my mind, was to give a free, open space for anyone in the UMW community to publish online freely. That's it. You didn't have any restrictions. All you needed was a UMW email, and you could publish anything you wanted. And that means students got on there, they started using it for study abroad blogs, club sites, course sites, personal sites, portfolio sites, etc. And it was really cool because organically we could see how people would use this stuff and then start really kind of developing for their uses. And it was really because it was a pilot for like three years. We ran it on external hosting. For the first year, it cost us like 30 bucks a month, and it grew up from 500, 600 users for the first semester to like 7,000 users and over 6,000 blogs. And you realize, Mary Washington, we have 4,000 students. So that's huge for us. It's like complete adoption, right? It's like I've created an <laughs> empire alongside, and I'm like you, like I'm like Darth Vader now with UMW blogs and the big <laughs> cape. And students are like, he's the one we hate. He makes us get on UMW blogs. But it's interesting, it became such a part of how people publish online. And there's a couple of reasons why. One of the reasons is we still have that kind of terrible storage space. We hid that, still have those tilde, J. Groom personal sites. And people realized around the university that they wanted a site that was easy to use. They wanted a space where it would be simple to share academic, student-created content with anyone around the web. So for example, this is Professor Steve Greenlaw's site. 
him and his students created a site which was about the 2008 financial crisis, right? And this is a highly visited site. Most of our sites default to open, which means anyone on the web can find them. And what's interesting is that you start realizing that people start reading and giving feedback to student-generated research and work. And this is actually happening a lot. So here's one example, and then this is another example. This is a student-run site in Fredericksburg. Now, how many of you are familiar with Fredericksburg, Virginia? Okay, a few of you. So if you're familiar with it, you probably know that the Civil War is a current event. Like, it's never really stopped happening. I'm serious. Like, okay, here's my story. I tell it every presentation, but I love it and I can't stop. So me and my wife are from Brooklyn. Actually, my wife is from Italy, but we lived in Brooklyn for like seven years. And then I got a job at Mary Washington, so we moved down to Fredericksburg. And it was on December 13th. So historians out there will automatically be like, ding. December 13th was the big battle, the first Fredericksburg battle, where the North got slaughtered. And they got slaughtered on the hill that I moved into, the house. So me and my wife are taking stuff out of our car and putting it on the thing. And all of a sudden, we see like people in northern outfits running down the street saying, it's a madhouse. They're slaughtering everyone. And my wife was like, what the hell's going on? Let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> they were reenacting on our street. And we were freaked out. Like we're from Brooklyn where like there's revolutionary history everywhere, but no one cares. Like they're graffitiing on it or they're peeing on it, right? There, it's like, it just um, blew up. And I was thinking to myself, like, this is really weird. So knowing that Fredericksburg is, in many ways, living in the time kind of machine that is the Civil War, the students at Mary Washington created a series of um, research sites, which were actually focused on historical markers in Stafford County, Fredericksburg County, and Spotsylvania County, which are the surrounding counties. And they did amazing research on these historical markers. They created a big Google map to point them. But they also did his research on them to give you books and backgrounds around this. Well, this is a site that's regularly visited. This is done by, a class by Jeff McClurkin. And we get like 10,000 hits. What's more is the community loves it. You know, they finally started commenting and saying, hey, Mary Washington actually does do something up there on the town. You know the town and gown stuff? Well, they were fascinated by it. And so the community. And this became a kind of bridge to thinking about what we do here and through these open pu publishing platforms is a way for public institutions to share the wealth and value of what they do. And this is a very easy site to create. And what's cool is it was created entirely by students. And the research was also done by them. This is a regularly visited site. Here's another example. This is a seminar taught by Marjorie Ah called Venice. And I love this example because they created an exhibit of research done on Venice. For some reason, this is the most highly visited site on UNW blog. It gets anywhere from 70 to 80,000 views on a regular basis. I don't know where they're coming from. I don't know if like, there's some bot engine just throwing views. But this also gets a lot of discussion around the students' work. One of the things they were discussing when they were doing it is they were discussing advertising in Venice. Does anyone know how they advertise? When they're redoing a, a new building in Venice, how they advertise is they take a big sheath of an ad, and they wrap the whole building in an ad, which is kind of despicable, right? Like, the whole building becomes a Calvin Klein ad. Like, oh, look at me in my jeans. And behind it is, like, you know, centuries of history hidden. So the students were railing against this. This is absurd. This is a kind of, you know, abrogation of the public trust in Venice. And then the advertising dude from Britain, who runs the company, got on their blog and was like, you have no idea. Without this funding from the advertising company, this would never happen. And the students in the advertising agent started getting a rumble in the comments. And I was like, this is awesome. This is like live interactive relationships that move us outside of the idea of theoretically this is bad, but puts us in a real relationship with people who have another point of view. And it was through this site that I started thinking like, this opens up all sorts of possibilities. But one of the things that happens when you're open is you can't predict what comes next which for me is part of the fun. Now, I want you to do a little test. I would like anyone, anyone have a computer in this room? <laughs> or an iPhone? Um, search the term in Google, banned art. Two words, banned art. And don't look at the pictures, because if Maplethorpe comes up and you try and sue me, I'm not responsible. Banned art. What's the first, banned, B-A-N-N-E-D. What's the first hit? We own the vertical 
and the horizontal, and I'll get to what that means. When you search banned art in Google, the first hit you get is a site created by a University of Mary Washington professor, Nina Michalewski. Now think about what that means. You get 96,000 students at PSU blogging openly on a platform that's Google friendly and the Google juice goes up. If you start to control some of these major points of research and interest for people all over the web. Another interesting thing is blue, what is it called? Black Mountain Poets. Search the Black Mountain Poets. We're the fifth hit in Google. And I argue that it's a better site, it's a better article than what you have in Wikipedia. And that's our students programming the web. And I think it's part of our obligation as a public institution to do that, to put good content out on the web and make it accessible. Now, I'm preaching to the choir here because PSU does that, and they do that right now. Now, 18th century audio. This is an interesting site, and this is this idea of kind of the unpredictability of open content. Marie McAllister produces a site where students actually record readings of 18th century poetry and put it up. And it just so happens that it's like one of the best archives of 18th century read poetry right now. What happens is students in Saudi Arabia have been using this regularly to learn English. Isn't that bizarre? Like they're learning how to speak English through like Robert Burns read poetry. Imagine how hard that would be to <laughs> speak English like Robert Burns. <laughs> I mean, that one, but this idea that you never understand when you put something out there how people will use it. And not controlling the context and letting that context reverberate through the eternity of the internet really changes the notion of what we do in the classroom. And I think the change is a cultural change of understanding that when you go into the classroom, understanding what, what you produce and research and create in that classroom should have a portal to the web that people can search, discover, and use, it kind of changes the way you think about teaching in some real powerful way, potentially. Now, this is another cool example from the UNW blog. And this is goes to our experiential learning, kind of doing this stuff on the ground. Every semester, students in this literary journals class, which is called Practices of Publishing, create a literary journal in WordPress from scratch. So what they do is, week one, they look at all these other national journals, they see how they're working, they talk about their mission, they frame a mission, they use Facebook, Twitter, MySpace when that was relevant, et cetera, and they created a critical mass around their journal to get people to sub submit. And by the end of the semester, they had to create a full-blown journal that they programmed, that they designed, and that they released. And we did this now for six, this is our sixth year, and we have 30 journals that were created by students. What's interesting about this as a project is that whenever one of these sites go down, I get an email from one of the students like, how can that go down? That's on my CV. This is something that they're linking back to and that for them is a real manifestation of the work they did in this class. And it's one that I think many of them are super proud of. So, okay. And there's more. <laughs> if you like the Lebowski, this is the film club site. This is interesting. And I'll talk more about this in a second. We started to see departments who couldn't, we were using Contribute. Does anyone know Adobe Contribute? Right, it's a nightmare. Like it was really like interesting in 2002, 2011. So we actually forced faculty to publish in there. So faculty took their department sites and started to move over to UNW blogs, which as you can imagine, <laughs> created issues, right? Their <laughs> department official sites are on UNW blogs. So what happened is our entire site moved now in opening in October to WordPress. So all of UMW.edu is going to be WordPress. And I'll talk about some of the implications of that for the work we've done in UMW blogs. But this is an interesting example of a site for a department that's using WordPress to share what they're doing. And notice that the front page is not a static brochure page. It's an ongoing series of posts created by professors about what they're doing in their class. What would it mean for departments at PSU to regularly, as part of their site, update you on their research, update you on what they're doing, update on what they're teaching, how they're teaching it, right? It would be pretty amazing to have some of your departments and some of the best scholars in the world producing regularly what they're doing and how they're doing it, right? And that no longer becomes the web as brochure. It becomes the web as a fish tank for the life of the mind at Penn State. And that's a powerful transition. And it's simple when you make publishing simple. It's a simple kind of transformation. Now, this is amazing talk about this, and then I'll actually move on to some different stuff. 
This is something we experimented with at Mary Washington. I really like this idea of the syndicated model. We actually found that students were actually publishing on UMW blogs from all over the world. They would go and study abroad and to stay in touch with their parents, they would use this space to write about what they were doing, sharing photos. And I started realizing this. China, Australia, Scotland, uh, Argentina, you name it, they were there. Mali, Africa. It was fascinating to me. So I said to them, hey, why don't you guys drop off your feed at this main site, studyabroad.umwblogs.org, and we'll aggregate everything. Well, within a month, we had 30 sites aggregating into this space, reflecting 30 different countries and their experience there. And I didn't have to do anything. All they did is drop off their feed, publish. Over the course of a year, we've had 700 posts, which actually chronicle the experience of our students overseas. And to me, this is like, if you're like a, a marketing person, this is like a layup. It's like handing it to you, and it's real, and it's authentic. And what if this becomes a model for how we share what we do at a university? And I'm really fascinated and intrigued by this idea of the public university and what is our obligation with publishing and with sharing to kind of frame this notion of education that moves beyond the campus, right? And not in some course modular that's controlled by an LMS, but out on the open web. To me, that seems like a moral imperative that we need to move to. Now, we aggregate Google calendars, same idea. Cool. People, all different departments from around our site, our school, use Google calendars. We found a way to aggregate them and embed them in WordPress so that we don't have to reproduce the effort, like copy what happened on this date to the main calendar. This idea of syndication and aggregation. Let the loosely spaced tools that everyone's using, let them use it. They like it, they're comfortable there. Just find a way to aggregate it cleanly into spaces where everyone can see it. That's the key. Now, presentations, this is an old one. Don't call it a blog, right? You like the kind of uh, surrealist nod there by Magritte? I'm pretty Tolstoy. Okay. <laughs> um, this is also this crazy thing we're playing with now. Now the chaos starts and the breakdown is going to start, okay? You can feel it coming. The energy is rising. Are you ready? DTLT today is something that was invented by a colleague of mine called Tim Owens. And DTLT Today TV is something that I'm on right now. And it's being run through an iPhone or an iPod Touch. And it's actually, we have the Wowser. It's basically called Wowser. It's an application that's a video server that we don't have to go through Ustream. We don't have to go through Justin TV. We can run it on Amazon. And from wherever we are, we could broadcast live to a video server. And so our group, Martha Burtis, Andy Rush, and Tim Owens and myself started to do a regular TV show called DTLT Today. It's 15 minutes every day. We talk about whatever we want. We have this couch that has affectionately been known as the cuddle couch. And we invite faculty and people on our campus who are doing cool stuff to come on to talk to us about what they're doing. And it's a simple act of reaching out and invitation has created kind of a critical mass around sharing and doing stuff and letting us know what's happening around our campus and what cool people are doing. And so we did this. It's become extremely successful. It's cost us next to no money. And we have the vertical, right? We can control how we share. Think about what it would take for you to create a TV show, right, in your office. We have an office with just an iPad and a couple of cameras and a Mac laptop. We're doing TV that's live streaming to the web that anyone can share. That's a revolution. And it's a quotidian revolution because it's slowly creeped up upon us. But when I tell you, you know what, you could do your own Dick Cavett show if you wanted to in your office, in your spare time, you'd be like, what? But you can. And I think it's something that that's amazing that we take for granted. But it's how can that not affect the way in which we share information in our time? It has to affect it. Same thing with the bullet. The university newspaper moved to our publishing platform. Right? It's another example. And what happened is as soon as we moved to WordPress, the local newspaper in Fredericksburg changed their whole site design because we made them look outdated. So they were watching the students' work and they were like, oh, wait, we have to change because they actually you know, were not keeping up with media. And that's actually something that relates to a lot of stuff. The Virginia Wolf again. And so this notion of 
personal spaces, which is what I started with and which one I want to continue here for a sec. What we found, and we didn't predict this, but it's really interesting, is we found that faculty and students alike started to use UMW blogs as a space where they would collect their information. They collect the work they did. They would present themselves to the world through these spaces. <coughs> and we set up a system whereby they could map domains if they wanted. So for example, this is a professional site for Professor Sue Fernsen, right? She's got her classes she teaches, home CV courses, you know, institutional links about. The URL is SuzanneFernSebner.org. Notice it's not UMWblogs.org. There's no tilde. And what's more is she can update it regularly because it's a WordPress interface. It's a simple state-of-the-art CMS that anyone could use, which brings us kind of to the next level of what you could do versus that HTML Dreamweaver site. And that's just one of many. Here's a student's aggregation of a portfolio of work they did at Mary Washington. The student blogged for 15 courses over her four years there. So she was actually there for three years. And she created a portfolio that streamed all of the work she did into this space. This is now her physical work she did in classes framed as a portfolio for her virtual work. I'm happy to say she's working as an instructional technologist in Morocco right now. And I want to believe part of that is because of the work she did with these sites and with understanding how this stuff works. Another perfect example. And students, no one's telling students to do this. These are just emerging. Notice laurafalcon.com, hosted on UMW blog. But here's that permanent sense of space. When she leaves UMW, that address stays the same. She comes and she goes and she takes all the information she did here and she puts it on another server or UMW or WordPress.com. She doesn't lose any of the links. There's that consistent space over time. That's a portfolio. When you do it and say like the domain you have on UMW once you leave or the email that goes away, this doesn't. You control it. You control the data, you control the domain, and you control who sees your stuff and how they see it. Right? This whole idea of FERPA is absurd because this puts all the control back into the hands of the student, which FERPA is supposed to do in the first place. So we control and help them control their data, which I think is integral to being a literate student in the 21st century, is understanding how data works and understanding how stuff is served and how you can control that. Now, we have this also with professors who are creating their own personal site. Again, Warren Rochelle. And it goes on. Right? This is token, this is taken hold, right? And I already did this idea of band art, Black Mountain Poets, but this idea of being open and this idea of being found. Over the last year on UMW blog, we've had close to 3.5 million visits from 260 countries, right? We're a small liberal arts college in the middle of Frederick. And we have people from all over the world who are viewing the work we do. That to me is kind of a moment to take stock of what we're doing in these universities and how we and the work we're doing can ultimately echo out into some kind of eternity. And there's that banned and dangerous art site I linked to before. Another example, and this is kind of trippy, and this is where you're kind of a techie to start thinking about this. My next idea is not only give everyone their own space, but give everyone their own network. So not only can a professor create their own blog on your other blog, they can create their own multi-blog installation. So it's jeffmcclurkin.com, and then he can have history101.jeffmcclurkin.com, which is his own blog on that, history455.mcclurkin.com, which is his own site for that. And he has his own network that creates site after site after site. So not only are you giving faculty their own space, you're giving their own network of spaces that they can create. And this would be easy to do. And it could also be done with map domains, which I'm fascinated by. Now, how many of you have seen the Adam special? Right, the HBO one? I was blown away by this. And I was particularly affected by uh, Jefferson and Jefferson's image in this. And there's something that Jefferson says in this um, uh, one of the last, I don't know if it's the last episode, but he's in France right now, talking about a concept known as the, let's see if we can get it, yeah, give me one sec. If it doesn't, just, I don't know why, well, 
not too worried, won't get concerned. One of the things that Jefferson talks about is this notion of permanent revolution, right? This idea of he has no faith in a country or a nation or a group of people that aren't constantly in revolt, that aren't constantly questioning where they are with a particular no motion or notion of democracy. And I'm interested in this as it relates to the idea of the web and publishing right now, right? The web and publishing has moved kind of you know, exponentially to the next level with allowing anyone to publish and share freely. And yet universities have kind of moved in the opposite direction to try and lock it down or not at all taking advantage of these new positions and possibilities for publishing. And so I'm interested in why, right? And there's this idea that Gardner Campbell, who's, a, who's now at Virginia Tech and who I worked with for a little bit um, at Mary Washington, came up with this notion that I think is compelling. And this idea of personal cyber infrastructure. Kind of the name is, seems a little bit like cyborgy. Like you're looking to see like, oh, students have a you know, mechanical eye and like one of their arms and we all have a chip in the back of our head. But it's not that at all. <laughs> the idea behind it is pretty simple. When students come in to a university, they start off, they get their own space. They get their own domain. And over the course of the next four years, that's their digital notebook. That's the work they're doing. That's how they're collecting it. And more than that, they control the data. They manage the space. They're their own sysadmin. And for too long, we've been divorcing the idea of literacy and writing and critical thinking from the actual means through which it's created and produced and shared in our age. I think part of what we need to do when we think about the creation of information and the critical interrogation of information is also understand where and how that information is created and served out which means the understanding of how this stuff works is crucial. What's more than that, if you give students a space with which they can create, it changes the relationship between how they create and the possibilities for innovation. If you give these sandboxes to students all over PSU, you have 94,000 students, what could that potentially mean for innovation? For a student in their room experimenting and doing something they haven't dreamed of. Now, Here's a kind of interesting quote from this. It's the only thing I'll read, but I think it's worth thinking about. So how might colleges and universities shape curricula to support and inspire the imaginations that students need? Here's one idea. Suppose that when students matriculate, they are assigned their own web server, not a gigabyte folder in an institution's web space, like I was talking about, but honest to goodness, virtualized web servers of the kind available for eight bucks a month, where they get on there, they understand how cPanel works, they understand how domain mapping happens. They understand, now some people say this is way too complicated, you're getting too techy. But I'm thinking like, how can this not be basic literacy about how we share and create content in this moment? About what is the actual mechanism for producing it, for connecting it? And I think all too often, we kind of leave that out. Now, this <laughs> leads me to a class I'm teaching which actually tries to imagine this experience. It's called DS-106, which is affectionate for Digital Storytelling 106. And the idea of this class is kind of simple. It's a digital storytelling class, but it starts with the idea that everyone who comes in gets their own domain and their own web host. And they have to figure out, it's like trial by fire. Figure out how to set it up. There's tons of resources called the internet. Don't come to me like, how do I do that? Google it. Find out the information, create the stuff, and share how you did it with others. So it's really abusive in that regard. But the thing is, is amazingly, everyone does it. How do they do it? Well, maybe because we said it's possible. It's not impossible. And so what happens is they create their own space. And what we do is we aggregate the work they do in their own space through RSS into this main core space. So what happens is every time they post, it shows up here. And one of the things that's cool about DS-106 is we opened it. We said, basically, we invited anyone who wanted to take it for free to take it. We had 75 registered students, and then we had another 300 to 400 students who took it out in the open. And they came by, and by, so here's the story behind this class. I announced it December 10th. By about December 15th, there were like 100 people who were creating animated GIFs for the class. So by the time the class started on January 10th, there were 200 posts of animated GIFs that when the students stepped in, who I were teaching at Mary Washington, were like, what the hell is going on? Why are there 100 animated GIFs? And what the hell do animated GIFs have to do with digital storytelling? 
people started doing the class before the class even started. And what's more, when our students at Mary Washington started posting, they got 10, 15 comments. Oh, great, welcome to DS106. And I didn't even have to do this. Could you imagine if you're using blogs in a class and as soon as your student writes their first post, 10 comments show up of people who are encouraging them? Right? That's a wet dream for a technologist to that happen, right? It's like, are you kidding me? That's amazing. And what we did is we did this by opening up the platform and letting anyone in who wanted to play, charging the credit students because they're going for a degree and giving them personalized attention, of course, but anyone could play along. And what happened with DS106 is it became kind of a happening. Not just a space, but a happening. And it's based kind of on this idea of the MOOC. Has everyone heard of a MOOC? Anyone heard of a MOOC? Okay, good. A MOOC is a very strange term, and it reminds me of Do the Right Thing. Hey, Mookie, where's my two fifty? right? It's Sal, you guys know Do the Right Thing, that great film by Spike Lee. I always love it, because MOOC, Mookie. Okay, good, at least one person gave me a yeah, thank you. Um, the rest of you are like, what the hell? Um, well, a MOOC is a massive, open, online course. And the idea is to create a course and structure a course that's online that some folks can take for credit, but anyone can take and follow along. This is kind of... Uh, and innovated by um, Stephen Downs, George Siemens, Alec Kuros, and uh, David Wyatt. And they did some amazing stuff with this. So I treated DS-106 kind of like a MOOC. The difference was it wasn't massive. 400 people is not massive. You guys have classes you teach that are 1,500, 2,000. You're like 400. You're a little massive. It's not massive. I understand that. But the implications and effects of innovation around 400 people taking a class like that out in the open could be massive. And what I mean by that is, let's take another example. How many of you are aware of this class at Stanford, artificial intelligence, right? A few of you. I think there's like 200,000 people signed up for this class now. That's crazy. And this is a class that's supposedly out in the open that anyone could take. And it's a class right now, at the point I did it, there was 96,000. So we're like 100,000 signups later. And I guess the word comes out that it's free open, anyone could take it, and you get a certificate if you want. But the issue is they're also developing a way to actually find a way to build an LMS around it that will manage 200,000 people. <laughs> but what does it mean to have 200,000 people taking a class and sharing that experience in however a distributed, fractioned way? This is kind of the questions that MOOCs position. How do we deal with the idea of some sort of organized, structured learning experience online that people can share. Of. A lot of it depends upon you being a kind of independent learner. It doesn't necessarily replace the face-to-face -face classroom experience. It's an experiment. Well, we actually got this idea, um, many ways kind of framing our stuff around the MOOC, but understanding we're not exactly a MOOC. We played with the idea of how do we network our teaching? <laughs> how do we open up the idea of sharing our teaching? One of the things that Martha Burtis and Tom Woodward came up with that I really loved is the idea of having students submit assignments. We had, in DS106, we go through design, visual, audio, video, mashup, fan fiction stuff. And we do all these experiments within those particular fields. It's kind of like a media production class, but also through narrative. So we actually asked the students and anyone online to submit assignments. Well, what happened is 150 to 180 assignments later, we have a repository of open assignments that anyone could do. And what we started to do is create it, and here's an example of them. Here's some um, particular assignments that were submitted, and that's what it looks like. You can actually click on the assignment, and if you tag it, any assignment you've done will show up underneath that assignment. So say 59 people do an assignment. All those examples of what they did show up under it. Here's a good example, right? So you know what that is? Can anyone name that movie? It's a white Russian, a rug, a toe, and a bowling ball. <laughs> the Lebowski, of course, right? You want a toe? I'll get you a toe. You know, three o'clock, I'll get you a toe. Right? <laughs> so they actually, close to 30 people did this. This is an iconic visual expression, right? Take four icons from a movie and you create it. Well, everyone who did that actually shows up here. So what we created is a repository. But we also said anyone could do to create any assignment, and you could decide what assignment you do. So here's a perfect example. We had a student, Colleen Trachy, who did, and there's an example of that assignment. We had a student, Colleen Trachy, who came up with this idea of the visual playlist, poetry playlist. 
you take your playlist from Windows or from iTunes, and you basically turn it into a poem. And I thought, you know, as an instructor, I was like, that's kind of a stupid assignment. Who would do that, right? So I kind of got snobby, like, whatever. 60 people did that assignment, and they were from all over the world. People in Portugal, Australia. I mean, what does that mean for you as a student when you submit an assignment and 60 people from all over the world do it? And it creates this kind of critical excitement around it. Well, that's not something I can do. And as an instructor, I could have given them 10 assignments, that's it, see you later. But through a networking kind of crowdsourcing approach, they had 200 assignments to choose from. And how they did it was kind of framed around the experience of a community. And that's what's interesting to me about DS-106. This is not about a class only. It's about creating a community of creative acts and of sharing. And it's a way to kind of imagine the online space as a space that is intimate, that isn't just a module or a divorce space. Here's an example of a 1984 assignment that was submitted by someone who I'd never heard of. They didn't do anything else. They just showed up one day, they submitted it, and they went. That's kind of how the MOOC works, too. You do whatever's interesting to you, you share it, and then you're out. If you're not taking it for credit, why would you worry about dropping out? Why would it even concern you? You do what you need to do, and then that's it. Does everyone read what's in the grass? <laughs> I want to tell you, this is a lawn in Melbourne, Australia. Someone mowed DS-106 into their lawn in Melbourne and then unmowed it. They got rid of it. And this was an assignment. And this is by a field respondent, Rowan Peter, who lives in Melbourne, who was taking the class and who actually started doing some amazing kind of fun, creative stuff around his house. And DS-106 kind of became like a meme in the class where people were just having fun creating around it. And then this happened. And I don't really know what to say about this. <laughs> this is kind of a wild example of a class gone wrong. So week two, we want to do everything we could not to reproduce the illuminate nightmare, connect, you know it, like, oh, here I am in this, you know, uh, kind of fluorescent lighted ugly space, and it feels institutional. We didn't want that. We wanted a place that was fluid, and that was free form and that anyone could get on at any time and share what they were doing. Well, Grant Potter, who's in northern British Columbia, said, I have an idea. I can create a radio server in IceCast that anyone who has a certain application called NiceCast or Latiocast or Latiocast, which is for the Mac, can actually get into, can broadcast, and anyone with an iPhone an iPod Touch, and an Android can, from wherever they are, start broadcasting. So Rowan Peter started broadcasting from Melbourne, what the cicadas sounded like in January, because it was actually summer there. And for us in Virginia, it was weird, because it was dead winter. And there was this weird sharing in space. And the thing of radio, what really hit me, is at 3 in the morning, I was hanging out with a friend who was in New Jersey, and me and him were doing our late night talk on movies on the radio. And all of a sudden, I hear someone walking down the stairs in his house. And go up to him and say, Mikhail, are you still on that goddamn radio? And it just changed everything for me. Because I was in his house, hearing his wife getting pissed at him for being on the radio. And it was online, and it was on the air, and it was social. And there was this relationship that we now can share out this stuff. People can program radios. Students can start creating shows and narratives that they can build into a radio. So one of the things that came up in our long conversations today was what it would mean for Penn State to have not only a TV station where you start interviewing the community, but what about a series of radio stations that was framed by work your students did in a class on a particular research about geography, right, about climate, about literature. And that work they did in your class was produced through a community of thought. And that we as universities start thinking about these means of production and sharing are at our disposal. They're easy. It's a matter of us rethinking our teaching to how we build this in as a part of the teaching as a sharing process, as an open learning narrative that students and us help build together. I mean, to me, it was radical. And DS-106, this radio really brought that clearly to me. And the guy, hopefully he'll show up. No. There's a picture here of Grant Potter who I want to give special kudos. I don't know why it's not showing up. But he actually you know, really came up with the whole DS-106 radio idea and made it happen. Well, soon after the radio came TV. So we had radio, of course, we need TV. So Tim Owens came up with this idea that we, through Justin TV, 
could actually create a TV station for the class. And we could start broadcasting out the stuff we're doing from anywhere. So one of the first things that happened is someone filmed a puppet boxing contest from New York City. It was on TV. What was cool is that was that someone in the class had a video, was able to capture it and share it instantly with the course. This weird space that like I had never really never owned a cell phone, I still don't. But once this class happened, I'm like, the mobile has really arrived in my mind. So let me see if we also had a Minecraft server. Any of you know Minecraft? It's like 8-bit gameplay. And I had no vision for it, but someone said, you want to serve? I said, sure. <laughs> People went into it, and they started creating DS-106 cities and playing around with this idea. And students who were into it went in there and played and shared. And I was, you know, why not? The other thing that happened is DS-106 took a weird turn. This summer, I had the idea of actually teaching the class as someone else. So what I did is it was a completely online class. My idea was basically I shaved my head. So I shaved the top. I'm not much to lose anyway. But I shaved the top of my head, and I shaved my beard, so I just had a mustache. And I looked like the character from David Cronenberg's video drum, Dr. Oblivion, who's actually a character based on Marshall McLuhan. And the whole idea was to come to the class and teach it from the first day as Dr. Oblivion. Now, the unique characteristic about Dr. Oblivion is he's never <coughs> been on TV. I mean, he's never been seen off of TV for 27 years in the movies. He's only been mediated by the screen. So my idea was teach a class online where you're always me only mediated by the internet. And so I went on this, and I started teaching the class, droning, talking about the internet. And students were bored. They didn't know what was happening. By day three, I started to have some real identity crisis. My wife didn't know I was going to shave my head. My kids were calling me Dr. Oblivion. It was really weird in my house. Like, everyone was like, get away from me. So I was like, I'm telling my the folks I work with, like, I don't know if I can go on with this. They're like, why don't we have Dr. Oblivion go missing? And he did. And then Jim Groom, who's me, came in as the TA and started talking about Dr. Oblivion missing. And then the class took on this emergent alternative reality where students were creating art and resources about finding Dr. Oblivion. And the class just kind of emerged as a narrative. And it was amazing to me because you can see some of the craziness I don't know why the videos aren't showing up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's actually, here's the video drum. But this is actually Dr. Oblivion. <laughs> so this is me with a shaved head. And people started making animated GIFs of him. There was a poster of Dr. Oblivion's Gone Missing that was put in New York City by people who had taken the class in New York City. And then this whole narrative around Dr. Oblivion started to emerge. And there was this kind of weird idea that the class wasn't just talking about digital storytelling. It was creating an episodic narrative over the course of five weeks. It started getting me thinking about, wow, the online teaching, we've only just begun to experiment with what's possible in this space. I mean, the idea of creating complete alternative realities for experiences and students to create and help build that narrative. To start thinking about how we can kind of frame and contextualize particular classes. And I know this is annoying you looking at me, because I can't even look at it. It's weird. But there's the poster. So students created posters, have you seen Oblivion? There's, there we are on Twitter. And it was this crazy thing. And then I had this video, and it might show up here, so I'm going to say for a second. I had this final video where me and Dr. Oblivion had a kind of face-off. And it was me as Jim Groom and Dr. Oblivion as Dr. Oblivion talking to one another. And we were having this argument, and I don't know if it will show up, but it was basically about what happened. Well, basically what happened is we all went away to Camp Oblivion, which was kind of a slasher reference. And Martha Burtis, who was another student teacher in this class, actually, she was actually helping me teach the class. She really wanted to be the Dr. Oblivion's TA. So she held me and Dr. Oblivion hostage at Camp Oblivion and started killing all the students. So this weird kind of slasher narrative emerged out of something that was just kind of an experiment. And unfortunately, it's not showing up because it's actually pretty funny. Um, so here is, any of you heard of Storify? Storify is this kind of new thing. One of the things, Storify basically takes tweets, videos, and other blog posts from around the web and allows you to integrate them cleanly into a narrative. Well, it was so hard to tell the story of Dr. Oblivion because so much of it was happening on Twitter or in the blogs or on YouTube. So we found that Storify was really cool for integrating it and telling the story of the summer of Oblivion and how Jim Groom went crazy. Because what I didn't mention is Jim Groom, the TA, started banishing people from the class. He basically started saying, you're banished. 
And the class got pissed, but they didn't know what was happening. So they created a separate alternate class called DS-107. And DS-107 was the student's class. Some students stayed with that class. Some students reacted against it. But what happened is the students started taking control. And they started to realize this was a narrative, and they started playing along. And I just was like amazed. I mean, I'm not saying this is good pedagogical practice, <laughs> but one of the things that also happens is people started to turn into Dr. Oblivion. So people in the class, and you see how what this created was a community of kind of sharing and of intimacy, but also the medium was perfect for it because we were creating for the web. We were experimenting with the web. The idea of this class, as much as it's about creation and these different tools, is about framing an identity online. My whole idea of Dr. Oblivion was a crisis of identity we face in this digital age. Who we are and how we frame ourselves online. And how malleable and fluid that is. And for me, one of the fascinating things about thinking about what we're doing in teaching and learning should be as much about thinking about critical relationships to how stuff is produced and reviewed, but also to how we're produced and created through this media. And how, in some ways, we have control over that creation process now, more so than we maybe ever had before. And I think that's a key kind of sense of responsibility. Now, I might jump off this to show you one video, um, if I have time. But I know I'm running out of time. So let me speak to this quickly. <coughs> Any of you ever seen this XKCD? Uh -oh. Right? Great one, right? Like, Here's what the university website does. Here's what people are looking for. Well, we have a new idea for our website at Merrill Washington. Our, where, well, our, our website is going to university, uh, going to WordPress, which is an open publishing platform. It's what we do you and the blog thing. Well, what happened is we started to get the idea of why can't we bring what's happening in the classroom forward? Why can't we use umw.edu as a syndication hub for all the academic stuff happening? So going to a departmental site, seeing what the faculty are saying, but also next to it, seeing what students are writing in, what students are saying, what they're producing. Make these department sites and make the umw.edu site a fishbowl of activity, of what's happening around the university. And to me, I think that's where the web kind of opens up all sorts of possibilities. I mean, people say the web's 20 years old. We're in kind of the, I think it's still infant. We haven't even begun to imagine what's possible for sharing the work we do and how we do it at public institutions. And there's all this kind of talk about open educational resources. And when you put it in that framework, it kills it. It like cramps all the life out of it. It's like open educational resources, as soon as you say that, it's like you put your hands around its neck. No, let's just publish on the web. Let's share freely what we're doing. And let's find ways to send it to the right place at the right time so people can discover it. And part of that is not understanding it as a web of a university that's faceless, but a web of a whole series of people who have an idea and an identity online that are sharing together, right, as a kind of community. And I think once our university web starts, starts, stops trying to become a kind of brochure, a kind of figure of what they think Mary Washington, the ideal of what Mary Washington should be, is at the point that they'll actually represent what it is through the voices of the people who are there and they're sharing. Now, one thing I'll point you to uh, before I end is this stuff is not happening only at Mary Washington. It's happening at places like the University of British Columbia. They're building an entire open source publishing framework in MediaWiki and WordPress for you know, a 30,000 person campus. So this isn't just about 4,000 small liberal arts. This is about a huge campus too. And the idea of publishing, whether it be video, audio, or on the web through text, is a way where we can actually use as a portal into rethinking some of the ways in which we teach and how we teach and how we go about sharing what we teach. Right? And I don't think online courses are actually a bad thing. I think they can in many ways help us reimagine the web if we think about online courses as native to the web. One of the interesting things I got from my students when we did the final evaluation is, out of the 25 who took the class for credit, 22 said that they couldn't imagine this class as a face-to-face -face class. Isn't that trippy? Because usually it's, I couldn't imagine this face-to-face -face class online. What happens when you change that relationship? That the class you designed and built was in many ways designed and built for the web, was designed for the web, was created for the web. That to me is a completely different architecture to thinking about sharing on this space. And finally, I'm interested in this notion and this is something that I think
Penn State is going to be a huge player in if they aren't already in developing for open source software and platforms. Develop an open source publishing platform to gradually integrate into the school's general education curriculum the deep, critical examination of how digital tools are changing the way we think and live. Right? It's almost like McLuhan, who during post-structuralism was kind of an afterthought, has come back to haunt us all. That the idea that these spaces and tools we use to imagine the spaces we're in, virtually, are changing us. They're changing the way we think about space and time and relationships and nation states and go on and on and on, economies. Right? We're in a fascinating moment. And rather than outsourcing this innovation, I would so much rather see it live and flower from our space. So with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you. Now, I know I went over time, but I do have time for questions. But it's past four, so you have to run. Obviously, I would not be concerned. But you have questions. So if anybody has questions or anything else, um, all we do is ask that you come down to the mics up front because we are pushing it out over the, the, the interwebs. So does anyone have any questions? And if you don't, I won't be hurt. I know I just blew your mind. I know you're just like this. That's why, right? Uh-oh, this is going to be big. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I'll kick things off. Oh. Um, thanks. Thank you. And what kinds of freedom did you have in terms of, uh, you know, again, please don't take this as a, as a negative thing, but no? what can a university do in terms of things like grading uh, to make that possible? In other words, I can't, people can't imagine that course as a face-to-face -face course. It's hard to imagine that course is something you would grade. Yeah. But I bet you had to do that. And I'm wondering, you know, what kinds of, uh, how do you reconcile your vision of education and things like Great. grades? Or, and okay. what, what did you have to do there? That's a great question. And the way we did that in DS 106 is, luckily, most of the people didn't take it for a grade, so I didn't have to worry about it. For the 25 students in a class who did, I met with them three times a semester, either in person or via Skype. And what I talked about is their progress. And there were certain things that they were expected to do. They were expected to blog regularly, reflect on their learning, and create these assignments. And so I could basically track their progress in that very easily and say, like, you're not keeping up with the work. And, you know, go through assessment kind of like anyone would. Now, when they were doing collaborative projects and stuff like that, like the radio station that they built, that was based on a group effort. And most of the grades really came out of, in my mind, their regular attention to the community. The idea of grades in DS-106 really came out of, were you giving back to the community? Were you involved? Were you commenting on people's work? Were you kind of a good kind of, I would think, you know, invest, did you invest time in this community of practice? And that, to me, was like where the grade came in. If someone came, they did their work, but they were completely uninvolved with the, feed, with the feedback, with the peer review, they didn't do well. And so we did have a rubric set up of what was created and what was expected. But in many ways, that stuff, when you're doing it online out in the open, it's apparent who's doing their job and who there isn't. So it's almost like it's easier to deal with the grading because it's apparent to everyone where they are. Now, I'm not going to say it's always smooth with grading. There's always going to be questions around grading. But that goes for any kind of course. You know, subjectivity creeps into that. And you know, we can try and say it's a science of assessment. But we all know that it ultimately comes down to a person to make that decision and that judgment. And you can, you know, basically say that um, assessment is an inexact science, and it's one that with a class like this that's based in creativity, that the portfolio project and, and kind of the way they do it in fine arts makes sense, right? To kind of review each other's work, give feedback, and also say where have you done, what have, where have you been, what have you done, and how has this class gone on for you? And, you know, I have no problem if everyone does the work and it's good to give everyone A's. Like the whole bell curve thing, I'm not so invested in that concept. You know what I mean? So um, I wish, frankly, it was a pass-fail class. I would have a lot more fun with it. Because um, then I wouldn't even have to think too much about that. There would be some basic guidelines. But you know, grading is interesting. I would much rather than think about grading and here's your grade to think about what portfolio do you leave behind. And that's where real qualitative portfolio-based classes can be far more powerful than here's your grade. And that I want to see you have something to show and something to share. To me, that's a class, and this is how this class should really run, based on your portfolio. 
And I'd love to see other students judge other students by peer review. Does that make sense? Yeah, please. Um, very interesting presentation. And, and, and along similar lines, you know, I kind of feel bad getting up here and saying this, kind of like, you know, that, that damper on things. But, you know, an exciting possibility. But what about some of the hurdles that you sort of see in the way? And, and you know, things that I've run into. I mean, uh, you know, I'm utilizing the blogs at Penn State here for teaching. Sure. I think it's great. Uh, one is the platforms, okay? So you're talking about WordPress. We're talking about movable type. We know which ones. Where do you stick with things? The other one is uh, what about copyright issues? You've got all these people sharing all this. You're talking about commons, and yet, you know, there's some rules there, and, and, and you don't get clear answers, particularly if you start asking questions. Yeah, um, I agree. And the, the last one that has really been a real damper for me, but is an issue that we all have to deal with, is um, dealing with accessibility. Mm. So, you know, do I have to close caption everything that I'm putting up? Yeah. It, it ends up being very, very, it, it sort of kills my ability to be able to do that. It really creates real problems. Okay, great. So I'll take three parts of that question. I'll take each of them. Platforms. I'm not too concerned about the platform, like whether it's WordPress or movable type, and that's why we've moved to the domain of one's own, so that whatever has an RSS feed should be able to syndicate in. So the kind of, the, the bare requirement would be RSS, the idea that what you do in one space can easily syndicate into another. So I'm not saying you have to use WordPress, you have to use Drupal or movable type, you just have to have something with an RSS feed. And that kind of, it doesn't solve everything, but it solves some of the platform concerns. The other platforms we use like Twitter, YouTube, right, they're basically free, anyone can access them, Flickr. We have a great thing where we do a photo, a photo shoot a day for two weeks based on the daily shoot site which gives you, here's the assignment today, find something with great angles. And then you just basically do an image of the angles and everyone shares what they did. The platform is kind of irrelevant. As long as you have a Flickr account, you publish it there and anyone can see it. So platform is something we've thought long and hard about and I don't think we've solved, but we're getting at it. Right, because we don't make people use UMW blogs. They can use whatever platform they want as long as it has an RSS feed. So there's one. Um, the other question about copyright. I'm of the mindset that universities haven't been nearly as aggressive as they can be with fair use and with the ideas of fair use. Now, I say this with the idea that, of course, that raises questions. But one of the things we ask students to do is we ask them to upload their mashup videos or the stuff they've ripped off of DVDs to YouTube. And what happens is YouTube kind of becomes the constable. It's basically like, you can't use this, hold that phone. You can't use this, you can use that. But like, they actually, it's weird, like YouTube has become in a position of a constable for copyright. When they find that they scan your video, which I think raises a whole bunch of serious issues. But at least immediately, it offers me a buffer between the students doing this stuff and them getting kind of sued by the DMCA. It doesn't solve copyright. But the other thing about copyright is the, uh, the Library of Congress just passed an interesting kind of, um, they not passed, they actually said, it's not illegal for a media student to rip a DVD or to jailbreak his iPhone or her other device for a class-based thing. So I wonder at what point are we kind of now pushing the edges of what that means. And I don't want to be flipping about copyright. Copyright's important. DS-106 radio is a copyright nightmare. People are uploading songs from anywhere and everywhere. I love it. I think it's great. But that doesn't change the fact that at some point, Copyright and universities are going to have to come to a head. I do not want to be at that head. I don't want Penn State University to be at that head, right? But the fair use question and how we deal with that. And there are people like at American University, uh, Professor, I think her name is Auerbach, but I'm not sure. She's doing some great stuff about fair use and what are universities kind of rights in this situation. And I'm of the mindset that I hope we get to a point where universities and campuses around the country are creating top content that is open and that we can actually share freely with one another, but also that we can use like a clip of a 70s movie like we would use a quote from a Shakespeare play and not have to worry about spending 10 years in prison. Like there should be some kind of viable cultural understanding that we could use some of these cultural artifacts freely without thinking that we're pirates. Because once we're all pirates, nobody's a pirate. And that's kind of where we're moving towards right now, right? Everybody here is basically, if you watch some infringement on YouTube, you're basically a pirate, according to the MPAA and the RIAA. And that raises real questions. Like, we're in a system that is transforming. And we need, as educational institutions, to be at the forefront of that. And I'm not saying just go crazy and, you know, have a free-for-all. 
but challenging that is hell again. And at a university, you know, a lot of things come. But if you take all the universities around and you start coming up with ways to think about doing that creatively, I, I think that's interesting. Now, the final question, the final part of your question, um, so I maybe not answered copyright back. What was the final? Accessibility. Huge question. I mean, WordPress is more accessible than our LMS, so we do have some value with that. But in terms of video and audio, I mean, that really does become uh, problematic. Like, can you have audio automatically transcribe into a post so that everything? We don't do that in DS103. It's not accessible to everyone, and I'll be completely honest. And I hope that part of what we do is some of these technologies Google uses to make sure we're not breaking copyright would be very useful to make sure that we're making it accessible to everyone. And I wish like we'd change some of the focus because one of the things that I found was really cool in DS106 and it was a project done by Tony Hurst who found by someone else is you could actually close caption a video on Twitter. So if you're going through Twitter, we had students actually close caption videos using the Twitter stream which then synced up with the YouTube video. And so there are kind of creative ways at these problems that I would like to use the class as a way to think through. But accessibility is a huge issue. And I think, you know, just about any class at any university in the U.S. and beyond would probably get dinged when it comes to accessibility because I think as a culture we haven't really paid close enough attention to that. And we have to make a decision to. So yes, DS-106 violates that, but um, I think a ton of sites out there do. And I think Univer Penn State, right, you guys are really thinking hard about this question right now, I can imagine. And it's an important one, too. And I think, you know, using open source, this is one of the things I talked about earlier. Using open source tools provides some interesting possibilities for accessibility. Like someone or a group of people developing plugins that you make a whole network more accessible, right? That you maybe develop a plugin or some sort of software that automatically transcribes video, right? Um, I don't want to think that this is out of the realm of possibility anymore. Especially, it's built right into YouTube, right? I mean, YouTube actually allows you to kind of go in there and subtitle film videos right out of the box. Um, that's a lot of manual labor, though. So how do we automate it? I don't know. That's a really good question. Um, smarter people than me better figure it out. But those are, I mean, all good questions. But I think questions that, rather than seeing this as a hindrance to what we're doing, it's even more a reason to go forward with it. Because these are all questions that need to be you know, dealt with. And I think hiding behind a wall, like is the LMS, doesn't help that, right? It, it kind of just hurts that culture. Um, inevitably. Yeah. I love this question. I can't believe. Um, do you have any other platform at UMW for um, digital records management other than just keeping the blogs intact? Um, or, I mean, you know, you're creating a lot of content. Is there any thought of how are we archiving this? Or, do, or is it not a concern? That's a huge concern. Um, here's how we do with the archiving. Okay, I'm gonna, that's a good question. I want to take it on two fronts. The first front is everything on UMW blogs is backed up independently. And we're now working with our library to kind of deal with how we can take stuff that we want to preserve for the record and pull it into their repository. So we're trying to look for ways that will make stuff on UMW blogs that is like theses, like the idea of submitting a thesis and bringing it into the library. So right now we're in those conversations. So we haven't figured it out yet, but we're trying to. <coughs> Another question that's a huge one is if you're a faculty member and you've had your students write a blog for your course, one of the things that's required in Virginia and probably here too is you have to keep that on record for X amount of time, right? So with DS-106, the question would be, if they're all doing it in their own space, how do you keep records and copies of all that? Well, actually one of the things we do, and this is a great archival tool, um, and there's another plugin I'll talk about in a second, it's called Feed WordPress. <coughs> Everything that feeds into the main DS-106 site is put into the database, and I can automatically save it. So I have a copy of every student's work once it's republished there, so over the course of three years, I can keep that work. So if I need to go to that, even if they get rid of their domain, even if they delete all that stuff, I still have a copy. So that's one way of archiving. There's another plugin that was developed by the folks at CHNM called Archive It. Archive It is a really fascinating plugin because it goes into a WordPress blog, and it takes the entire blog, and it archives it locally as a PDF or as a file, kind of like what you were doing, Carla, with the, the yeah, it's awesome, pack it up. It's kind of like pack it up, but it puts it in ebook form, it puts it in PDF form, and then it saves it as a local version. So there's another way to archive this stuff in different forms. So this is why I'm excited, and I mean, I don't need to, you know, PSU's been doing awesome stuff. You don't need me to tell you this, but I'm excited at the idea that you might be developing in an open source platform like, hey, WordPress, and all the stuff you do, little old Mary Washington that's poor, 
in Fredericksburg and still concerned about the Civil War can benefit. <laughs> and that all of us as universities, public and open universities around the country, can start creating, a, I think, a critical mass for opening up these tools and making them freely available so that that poor institution, or even a school that's not related with higher ed, can benefit from our process, can benefit from what we're doing. I mean, it's kind of like an ecosystem of sharing, and I love it because it's more sustainable, right? Or I want to think it is. Does that make sense with your question? Anyone else? Yes. I'm just going to follow up on Tim's question. Um, and the Internet Archive is also yes. archiving all those blogs, right? Absolutely. So, and that's totally open. That's really cool. So I have a question that's also related to archiving, which is about a project you might have heard about that uh, University of North Carolina is doing. It's called the Lifetime Library Project, where they're going to give, they're, they're piloting it in their library school, and they are going to give um, lifetime server space to all their library school students so that they can archive their personal libraries and have access to them for the rest of their lives. So my question to you is, you know, you, I liked how you let, ev you know, you encourage everyone to have these more open URLs so that they're not tied to the institution, so that they move on and their work moves with them more openly. Yeah. So what do you think of an initiative like this? Should it reside with the institution, that archive? Or, or is it more about acclimating people to the open web and thinking about their products as a body of a whole? Well, that's a great question. And I think right now there's two ways to think about it, right? Right now we've moved to the personal and we've argued the personal at Mary Washington because the institutional kind of space for archiving the stuff doesn't exist. So unlike the uh, Univer uh, University of North Carolina, we didn't come up with a magic project. Now what would be nice is if you archive everything you do in your own space and it automatically archives that other space. This is the whole thing that I've always thought would be interesting. Why wouldn't we upload a video to YouTube or Blip or Vimeo? There's not a little button that says, do you want to also archive this on the Internet Archive? So that when you're doing it in your own space, you can also archive it on that space. So if they actually developed it with a sense that this may not be the only place you want to keep it, I think that would be great. And this brings me to another interesting question um, about the Internet Archive and Brewster Kale, who I love, right, because his vision is basically I want to archive all the world's information that was ever created, period. Like, I love that vision. Even if it's not possible, it's great. Well, he was talking recently on Democracy Now! about the Google Books initiative and that ultimately the Google Books initiative became something that I think is why we should be a little bit wary about Google email and stuff. Basically, they emailed or they, they scanned all these books from the University of Michigan, all these other schools, and these orphan books right now, right, that aren't in publication, and it's not very clear who has copyright, is kind of coming under Google's control. And Brewster Kahle is actually challenging this idea and this access to this information. And these are key issues that focus around copyright, they focus around publishing and archiving, and they focus around the idea of having open access. I wouldn't want to think that we all need to go through kind of Google's checkpoint, an advertising company, to get access to all the world's knowledge. Right? There's some real questions um, about that. Not that Internet Archive is ultimately the solution. It's a very slow site. It has a lot of kind of infrastructural problems. But I love the way theoretically they're challenging some of the assumptions we come with Google. I think as a culture we've been way too trusting of Google. And I don't think that's a bad thing per se because we've benefited in some real ways. And I use Google. I'm not going to say like I'm free of Google. But I think when it comes to the world's information and the world's best thought, it was universities traditionally that were the kind of the safeguard of that. And I'm wondering if we're giving away the farm a little bit. And Internet Archive, and particularly um, Brewster Kahle, really raises some of those questions in what I think is a great kind of interview about where we're at and what does archiving mean. And I'm fine if institutions take a role in that. But institutions have failed up until now because they haven't made it easy enough for people to do it there and elsewhere. And to think about an infrastructure that makes it simple. Because once they figure that out, then what does Google have over that? Because that's what Google's figured out. And I think now we're at a place with open source being mature enough that we can do this well. And we can do this together. And that's what's exciting. I mean, that's what I think is potentially going to move us, hopefully. I mean, I always feel like we're in a particular critical moment. We could go a lot of different ways. Dystopia, right? We can see the dystopia everywhere, right? Apocalypse film, the world is ending, right? Nothing sustainable, we're all going to die, peak oil, right? But then the other one is rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> and I want to believe that we're moving towards rainbows and unicorns, right? And that we can control that, that we're not without agency. 
And I think taking back some of that agency starts with something as critical as who we are in this new media. And to me, that's far bigger and transcendental when you think about that versus a tool to use. Right? Tools just become the way to exercise some of our power in this space. So. Uh, please, um, I want you to join me in thanking Jim. And um, thanks, Jim, sure. for coming. <laughs> I'd let you go on forever, but the web can't handle it, so we gotta we gotta move on. And rainbows and unicorns, that's so it's perfect. I have a whole new image of you. That's all I, I said. Um, if if you want to continue the conversation with Jim, we're planning on um, just going out to autos later this evening for informal just get together. Um, if you're if you're gonna come, just RSVP to me, and I'll get a tape. No, I'm just kidding. Just just show up and, and be there. But but thank you so much. And I wanted to mention that we will be announcing the symposium keynote speaker is Jane McGonigal this year, and that is on March, yeah, yeah. And that was on March 26th, right? So, or 16th. Yeah, around that point. 24th, March 24th. See how I, well I know about my point. Anyway, thank you everybody for coming. Thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, that was awesome. That was great.